Hello and welcome to Deep Impact, a proud member of the Doof Network where we dive deep into Wabo's most work five years on. Coming up next is Elliot Diebold. And that was Ruben Morehouse. And we are back to talk about Null 9.4, uh, which is a, a big chapter. Some stuff <laughs> goes down. <laughs> Yup. And so we kind of pick up from the last chapter where Blake embraces Carl, his uh, BFF, uh, and he kind of realizes, awakens, and I don't know what the right word is, um, comes to uh, mm. in a sort of uh, stage play version of his past. Um, the first time that he ever felt true peace in his past, fencing, uh, like putting in fences on a farm, not fencing. Yeah. And, well, this is really our first clue that that Blake is fake because nobody's ever found peace <laughs> while fencing. Um, it's so made up. He has to be a vestige. Um, you know, like I get like there's there's something cathartic about say like gardening, but fencing's too far. No, mm-hmm. it's too it's too intense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I I I love this. Uh, you know, set up for mm. you know what is the sort of conceit of the chapter. Um, it, it's very quickly differentiated from any of Blake's other visions. Yeah. Um, th- this isn't. This isn't something he's reliving. It's something he he and and everything else is reenacting. Yeah, uh, and it's like a it's like a twisted simulation of <laughs> of his past. Yeah, so I'm going to read out a, a little quote to set that stage a bit. Uh, Blake thinks here and there I saw animals in the distance: a gaunt horse, a cow with some prolapsed uterus or intestine dangling from its rear end, a goat with blood on its snout, and it <laughs> like. Okay, so on the first read through, you're like, okay, this is Drain's shenanigans, right? Setting this up, um, like this is a, yeah. a Drain's version of what a vision is. But, but, and and that kind of does tie into the idea of what the Drain's is, where the Drain's is kind of sucking away parts of Blake, and and maybe this is a bit like his memories getting distorted as the Drain's has their has their way with them. But it's considering that that how the chapter ends it's so interesting to think about this version of reliving your past versus the other versions we've seen of blake reliving his past where this one is the one where he actually kind of gets to see that it's all fake <laughs> mm. yeah um yeah and i mean that's the thing like the first time i was reading through it it like a lot of the the sort of i guess gory and and, and gross alterations being made to this memory didn't weren't like quite clicking for me like i was mm. like i guess this is the drain's like yeah. as you said, it's like this is representing the drains taking the memories, but it didn't it didn't sit right with me. And of course now we sort of know a bit more, and it's like oh, it's because they're being twisted because they're not even real. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. It's sort of, it, but you know, it, you can you can sit through it the first time, and it kind of makes sense. And then in, it's one of those great packed things where then in retrospect you're like oh. Mm. Like, it wasn't saying X, it was saying Y. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, in the memories, uh, Blake kind of is, is thinking about uh, the, the kind of farmer who runs the farm interrupting Blake, uh, saying that they need to chat. Blake has been here to kind of find a, a place to work uh, for board and food, um, but because winter's coming... Uh, he is not, they don't have, he doesn't have the clothes to do work in the winter and the family can't afford to buy him the clothes. And so they kind of have to let him go. Yeah. And this is sort of where we really hit what Blake discussed with the the nice witch lady mm. uh, last chapter, whereas he, in this reenactment, like the reason this reenactment is so terrifying is not because he has to relive yeah. things, but because he has to choose to relive it like this whole chapter is sort of defined by blake constantly being like oh i have to choose this like fuck this place yeah Um, yeah he can opt out at any time (laughs) yeah Yeah, it's 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 this like sick kind of test yeah and i mean i actually really liked the way the chapter sort of kept coming back to that a bit and and, Mm. and it would cut to present time blake's thought process and he'd just be like man I can't believe I'm having to do this because I kind of kept forgetting. I kept getting caught up in the retelling and I actually did need, like, I'm really glad Wildbo included the the frequent sort of, just Character a reminder. breaking that, moments. That, yeah, yeah that, that Blake is having to choose this because that just makes it even worse. And I kept forgetting. One of my favorite parts of this chapter, we'll talk about this later on, is where Blake also gets swept up into it, which I really love. Mm. Um, mm. Anyway, uh, yeah. And so kind of j- jumping back onto the base layer of, of Blake... Uh, reliving his past here it it really is like sad right like he 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 was homeless and he finally kind of found a chance for himself to start again and through no fault of his own like he has been working hard he has been obviously leaving a good impression on these people he, he 
it, he's just it's just kind of gotten fucked up just by circumstance and it's it's shit like it's shit that Blake has to relive his his life just getting fucked up without his own input yeah I mean it's just not fair like nobody's yeah. winning you know the farmer wants to have him Blake wants to be there but due to something that's out of both of their control that just can't happen like it's just unfair yeah um and and you know obviously we'll get into sort of some more stuff about why uh blake has these memories later yeah Um, i guess we should say we're gonna we're obviously touching on some of this stuff as we go but we're gonna do a bit of a deeper dive at the end about what the big twist actually means and kind of explore it in its own little space towards the very end yeah yeah um so so the old man the old farmer i I feel bad calling him the old man (laughs) he doesn't seem that old um (laughs) he he calls him yeah, I suppose. But then this is quite young, Blake, right? Like when you're, yeah. I don't know, 20 or 19 years old, yeah, you, you kind of 35. do think of... Yeah. <laughs> um, so Blake and the old man drive into town uh, and so that Blake can basically ask if anyone has any spare winter clothes that he can use so that he can stick around, um, which seems like a good plan. But Blake kind of gets sidetracked because he runs into Carl and a few of Carl's friends. And Carl promises to give Blake some warm clothes if he comes around to their house later. Um, what a nice guy. Hmm. Yeah, uh, what could possibly go wrong? And I mean, that's the thing, right? Is we, like, we're sitting here knowing, like, first of all, we, we already know how things end with Carl. Yeah. And we're in Blake's head, so we're seeing how traumatic this is is for him as he's going through it. So, you know, it's not going to go. And, and, like, that adds to, like, I'm just sitting there halfway. For, for most of this chapter, I was just like, don't do it, Blake. Like, change mm. the script. It's worth yeah. it. Probably. Well, that's like, the thing, right? Blake is Blake has to struggle to be able to say his lines, for want of a better phrase. Um, it's such a like it's such an interesting way of showing the conflict because we're not just we're not just seeing it be relived and kind of intuiting the meaning from the greater context that we know. We're seeing Blake struggle to have to relive it actively, um, mm. and he even kind of <laughs> plays with the script a bit in order to get across the emotions with context that he has now. Like he kind of fucks with uh, with with the script a little bit in. Ways of subtle rebellion against Carl, but he still Mm. has to go along with it in the end. Yeah, and I think that's a really important part of this chapter, actually, that you just sort of touched on, is that Carl is an actor as much as Blake is. Like, like everything else seems to be automatically following the script, and there's this kind of conflict rivalry between Blake and the shadow Carl. Mm. Uh, Yeah. It's it's really interesting, because I think it helps sort of frame the conflict of the chapter, rather than Blake just kind of being shat on by the world that he's in mm. right now you know having having carl as this sort of opposition who's like literally antagonizing him for most of it yeah uh, is, is um it helps sort of ground it and, and focus like you know blake's drive it makes a lot more sense yeah yeah it's interesting i wonder if it would be better or worse for blake knowing that the fake carl that the blackfish was like not an actor was not kind of aware of this whole situation yeah, mm. like for for me, I think it would make it harder because it, it uh, like as a reader, even I just targeted all my hate towards the shadow Carl, which I mean <laughs> is actually kind of bad because it's part of Blake. Exactly right, and, uh, and with the context of who, what who what Blake is, I, are we going to call Blake a what? I think we'll keep calling him a who. <laughs> with the context of who Blake is, um, it. Uh, like it makes it even more important thinking about the the shadow reflection of himself that he hates mm. when mm. in the context of him being a vestige, right? Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Uh, so uh, Blake does agree to go to Carl's and later on goes to Carl's and gets some clothes and uh, kind of gets sucked in by his helping nature into helping them build a chicken coop and then kind of relaxes with them after they're finished. Um, parties he doesn't drink but they drink and he kind of gets uh f- he flirts with a girl or a girl flirts with him and he ends up sleeping with this girl um and that's we see that and then we see him as a part of the commune and we're left to fill in the blanks of him just kind of deciding to to stay with them yeah and, and sort of after this there's that bit where he's shopping with the friends and he mm. sees uh, like the the old man, the farmer, um, yeah, and the farmer seems disappointed, and Blake just kind of avoids the whole situation. Yeah, he and, seems and feels... pretty disappointed in him, right? Yeah, and Blake's pretty disappointed in, in himself for at least how he handled it. Yeah, um, but it, like it's interesting because obviously this is made up. <laughs> yeah, this is all fabricated. So, yeah. like, my question as I'm going through all of this the second time is is always like, 
So, so why? Wait, why did they create this aspect? Why did Granny Rose presumably set this memory yeah. up? Yeah. Um, and I have, like, I, I sort of have more to say on various bits towards the end, but this was one I was, like, a little unsure of. Like, I, I think this is just meant to... This is part of what feeds his drive to always make things feel even, because mm. this is a situation where he didn't, and it hurt everyone involved. Yeah, I, I, I think... So, so one possible counterpoint to that is we don't know how much of this stuff actually might have happened to Rose realistically. Like there is a there is a there is a read on this that some of these things are versions of what happened to Rose. I mean we kind of see some people seem more real than other people, um, which means maybe the, those are actual memories that Rose has or like versions of Rose's memories. But assuming that this is all made up, my, my kind of read on it is basically Granny Rose needed to set up as shitty a trauma for Blake as possible, right? Like, as <laughs> shitty a backstory for him as possible to yeah. really fuck with him and drive him into the way that they wanted him to be driven. And so it's not just, no, you can't just suffer, you know, her, uh, abuse at the hands of, of, of kind of her, a horrific person. We need to feed into that shame and guilt more. And so it kind of has to be, you have to feel additional shame about the way that you handled this other part that led up to it and, and kind of all these factors that make it feel as as bad as possible to Blake. Mm-hmm. That's my thought. He, yeah. Because he gave up something else to choose to be there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, and, and I mean, so on, on what you just said, like the whole thing about how varying people have varying amounts of humanness yes. uh, in these memories. Um, I mean, kind of most of this chapter, I was like on the side judging Blake for not remembering like Fungus Face's name. Mm-hmm. Um, considering it's pretty clear, like, he was quite tight with her for a bit. Yeah. And, uh, not really remembering anyone's, but particularly these girls he was, like, sleeping with. Or so, yeah. like, uh, you know, Blake's kind of an asshole not remembering any of these people's names. And, mm. I mean, you know, it's not his fault, turns out. <laughs> yes. Uh, they probably never existed. And maybe even if they did, the drains has taken his memory of them. So, mm. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> whatever. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So... I mean, the other part of this I, I like is we really get to see Blake watch his his slide into this, right? Um, which is pretty heartbreaking. Um, yeah, yeah. I think it's interesting that we don't see the the point of him actually joining the commune, right? We see him, you know, flirting around with it, and then we see him as a part of it. And there's no in-between. And I think that it's it's possible that that just doesn't exist, right? Like, mm. No, I, I would know. think this is, this is something they sort of snuck through. It was just... He was staying and helping and staying and helping, and then it just sort of everyone realized it was a permanent thing now, except for Carl, who'd been planning it all along. Yeah. Well, but what I mean is, like, maybe, you know, the me- they didn't actually make the memory of Blake officially joining the cult or whatever, <laughs> right? Like I that, see, I see, yeah. That they can just kind of patch over it and be like, you know, it's, it's like that thing of... Um, you know, a filmmaker shows one scene and then shows another scene later, and we as the audience assume the, the interstitial bit, but... For all we know, it never actually happened, right? Which which mm, is mm. pretty uh, overtly on the nose with how Granny Rose was creating these memories, you know? Yeah, um, probably. Anyway, so we kind of jump forward again, uh, and uh, the girl that Blake had slept with is pregnant, but it's not his, uh, which relieves him a little bit. Um, it's Carl's baby. And Blake kind of, this sets off a thought in Blake of, hey, she was possibly thinking of leaving before this happened and now this seems like she's gonna be forced to stay here and this seems like Carla's kind of set it up in a way that's a little bit skeevy uh, and it kind of starts Blake on the ra- on the route of one too many things don't add up here what's going on yeah and I love this there's sort of three very short sections mm. of the story here that really ramp up your sense that this is a cult like you know there's yep. sort of the there's this bit where she finds out, where we find out she's pregnant. You're sort of like, uh, uh, is this uh, like a bit culty? And then, and and then, sort of, as, as she's sort of being forced to stick around, you're like, uh, and, and then, uh, obviously, Blake starts to confront Carl directly, and you're like, oh, like, yeah, yeah, okay, this is, yeah. I, ugh. I think the line that really sells the cultishness to me is the last line of this section here, where Blake thinks the peace of this place had been disturbed, which is such a like. I don't know. It gives me such cultish vibes because this place has a a level of peace and anything that disturbs that is, uh, you know, against the group. Like, Mm, mm. can't disturb the normal functioning of this cult. Um, That kind of, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, you're right. 
Um, one other interesting thing to note that I'm not really sure what it means is as we see time pass in these memories, in these visions, um, in this play, uh, the people involved become less and less monstrous. Like fungus faces, fungus face has become less of a fungus face, right? Um, and I'm not sure what that means. I'm trying to figure out what I think it means in, in the context <laughs> of uh, Blake's memories and in the context of Blake being a big fake. Um, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, my understanding the first time I went through it is it, it was, you know, symbolic of how important and close to him they were, mm. um, particularly when we see Alexis soon. Yeah. Uh, now, like, I guess it's probably still that, right? Like, mm. um, like I, I guess, you know, the memories being fake don't really change that. So that's sort of been my thing is it's symbolic of how much effort was put into the memories of the people at that point. Yeah, that makes sense. As in, you just... The, Granny Rose is happy to just let Blake's brain fill in the gaps of the parts that she didn't create, and that was less mm. in, in the past, and it's getting more and more, you know, with the key players. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so, uh, we, we talked about this. Blake has kind of become disillusioned with the cult. It's kind of not quite put it together enough to be able to confront anybody about it, but is withdrawing a lot from everybody. Um, hmm. and Carl comes and, and him and Blake fight, uh, as Carl kind of brings in some newcomers and, and Blake decides to run off trying to convince the newcomers to leave with him, but only one goes Alexis. Um, I was so fucking glad to see Alexis. Yeah, I know, like, right? It's I a knew, friendly I... face in such an unfriendly <laughs> environment, which maybe is a bit of a trap, but I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I was just like, oh, like I needed it. I think Blake needed it. Uh, it was so good to see her. Like, it really yeah. mattered to me. Yeah. Um, and so I want to read out this bit where Blake is confronting Carl uh, because they both kind of have this weird interplay of being on the stage and off the stage in very interesting ways. Um, I want to read out this section. Blake says, pair off. Like how you pointed fungus face my way? I asked. Fungus face? He arched his eyebrows. Breaking script, both of us. When I seemed jealous about fungus face and the other guys, you pointed teeth my way. One by one, all the girls. You sent the little sister to my bed the night I seemed unsettled about the pregnancy. Now you're very subtly hinting for me to go keep Alexis company. Um, it's interesting. They both break character and Blake is called out on breaking character, but he kind of is in the zone enough that he's just kind of using this as an opportunity to confront Carl and kind of fix some of his mistakes. Mm, mm. Um, he, he calls out to one of the other people who are overhearing this conversation saying, like, you know, this is true. Get out of here. Run away while you have the chance. And what they is, do. It's, it's fungus face herself. I right. Think. Right. Um, um it's, it seems weird. Like, I don't want to keep calling her fungus face. <laughs> <laughs> but there's nothing else to call her, right? Yeah. Um, don't feel bad about it because she's probably not a real person. <laughs> um, but like, and, and this is explicitly something that Blake calls out about as something he didn't do, but he wishes he had. This is a regret that he had about how this went down. Um, mm. And this is interesting to me because he is breaking script. He is trying to, I don't know, confront these memories, um, which doesn't seem to go badly for him. In a way, it kind of helps him realize what's actually going on, uh, which I think is interesting. Yeah, well, I guess because for a lot of it, it comes down to, you know, he doesn't need to the, stick to the script 100%. He's sort of identifying what what the drains wants out of him at any point, And it's about, like, moving around that. So there are some things he can't change and there are other things that he can. Mm. Um, this is sort of one that I think was really pushing the line. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, it was sort of important to who he is. And, yeah. Mm. Um. Yeah, so Blake and Alexis run away, and then we jump forward one last time. Uh, Blake is in the homeless shelter that he and Alexis have kind of escaped to, uh, but Carl finds them, um, and Carl confronts Blake, and we get close to reliving uh, Blake's trauma, but before this happens, Blake realises what's happened. Um, Rose isn't the vestige, he's the vestige, and this is all this is all a situation that has been faked to make him into the person that he is now, the sacrificial pawn for Rose. Man, what the fuck? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> this, I mean, for a story that's already kind of been defined by, like, mind-bending, story-shattering twists, mm -hmm. I think this one takes the cake by a fair margin. Yeah, it's a big um, one, right? Um, and it, uh, the thing I love about it is... Um, uh, it kind of reminds me of, of when Mrs. Lewis in The Drain said, well, isn't it strange that you remember who you are? And we were kind of like, oh... Is that something that we should be thinking about? Um, <laughs> it's these little pieces. It's these little dangling pieces that were never really puzzle pieces. They were just kind of things, right? Um, you know, and Blake calls them out. He calls out 
he, he, it was weird how Blake always seems to be able to kind of heal up relatively quickly from things and, um, glamour. He's, he just kind of had a natural inclination for glamour. Um, mm. uh, like he, he always kind of got hurt in, in weird ways. Um, which I think is my favorite reveal about this, that, that Blake's, uh, like, uh, hatred of, of physical contact is just a very practical thing that was set up by grandma mm. rose to to avoid mm. people from noticing that he was a vestige like i mean my favorite damn. thing is is the the tattoos finally made sense it's always kind of bothered me that for no reason his tattoos had some sort of magical powers mm. uh like it didn't seem like other practitioners tattoos did that and mm. if they did why didn't other practitioners have cool tattoos that they mm. could use to know about themselves so yeah. I, I always found it kind of confusing how unique his tattoos were and that was a piece that finally fell into place this chapter yeah you know um, it's kind of it kind of feels like a larger version of there was that chapter where blake was talking to conquest and there were multiple times where conquest would be like all right now i'm gonna end this conversation but then he never did and it was a mm. weird thing that you kind of chalk up to oh it's just a dramatic trope like it's just a thing that happens it's fine but of course nothing like that doesn't have significance impact like these <laughs> yeah, things exist yeah. for a reason um and this is the reason and it's uh it all kind of comes crashing together in a big penny dropping moment that i i loved mm. well i guess so it's interesting we've we've hit the end of the chapter now and mm -hmm. i guess before we get into our bonus bit i guess one more one more thing i want to say about this chapter specifically is like so this was the longest chapter impact like mm. i think there was like chapter four point twelve is is almost the same length, and then beneath that in third place is like you know a thousand words down. Like by a fair margin, this is a very long chapter. Yeah, and I feel like we moved through it pretty quickly, mm. and you know I felt the same thing during my live reads. Like I didn't feel like there was as much as I was tweeting about, and I was trying to think about that because it's not like I didn't like the chapter or thought it was you know unnecessarily bloated. Mm. Um, but like it's just. It's just such a ride, right? Like, mm. <laughs> like I think that's what it is. Is like yeah. I was just sort of yeah. go over it and like not a huge amount of distinct events happen in this chapter, but mm. it, I mean they're all very important to you know telling us about who Blake is because that's really the point of this chapter is we finally get an insight into this past that he's avoided. I mean, yeah, sharing. This, this, this has been one of the key things that has been defining Blake that we haven't seen, right? I mean, probably mm -hmm. the key thing. I mean, yeah. explicitly the key thing that defined Blake. <laughs> I mean, it was set up to define Blake. Um, and, and, you know, we've hinted at it and we've kind of danced around it. And finally we get to see it all. And it it's great. And I, the, that's the thing I love about this chapter is it's not just we get to see Blake's backstory. It's Blake confronts his backstory and and uses that to mm. learn a new key piece of information about himself. And it's such a, like, it's such a cool way of doing it. It's such a, like, efficient piece of storytelling, right? Because you can imagine other stories have the, oh, this is the flashback bit where we get to see what mm. happened to this mm. person. But here it's taking that literary trope and doing something very, very different and very, very interesting with it. Um, I, I mean, that's I almost... That's almost packed in a nutshell. It is packed like, in a nutshell. And is, this is uh, like a take, great, yeah, a yeah, great distillation a, of it. You take a trope, you, like, add some big new twist or development to it, and then yeah. also have all the characters be aware of it. <laughs> <So the pack laughs> and be fucking so freaky far. monster actors <laughs> playing it out. Like, man, it's so awesome. Um, um, but yeah, so should we move into our yeah. so uh, let's, bonus bit? Let's talk about... So, okay, before we do this, though, we do have a discussion question out at the moment, and we're going to do our yes. answers to it in our next chapter, I think. So, this is probably your uh, last chance no. to... Oh, this is the last one to enter the questions in, but right, we won't be yeah. doing it till 9.6. Yeah. So, get your answers in. What's the discussion question it's, again? It's it's a, a list of What a, historical yeah. or mythological uh, person went into the drains and came back out, and what did they lose on yeah, the Yeah, how were they changed? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is your last good chance. If you're listening to this, leave your answers in the discussion thread for this uh, for this episode, which will be linked down below. Yeah, and, we, already uh, got, we already got a couple of good ones. Awesome. Uh, I'm pretty excited to tackle this. Yes. Well, we'll get to that in a chapter or two. Uh, for now, let's talk about what the fuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the title we have here in our notes is Elliot Rambles About the Implications of Yet Another Story-Altering Twist. Mm -hmm. um, this is, is this the biggest one, do you think? I mean, it, it was must. for me. Yeah, well, I feel like, like it is. Because... For, like the first thing I want to address here is like I didn't even I didn't even consider this like mm. I don't think seriously at any point like maybe maybe very briefly in arc one there was the whole oh what if 
you know, Blake's the vestige thing, mm. but wait, not not for a very long time. Not that I can remember have I ever seriously considered or even glancingly considered this. And like mm. I think the biggest reason for that is like so Alexis and like all the others and like does that mean like are they real? Like is Alexis a vestige as well? Uh yeah, but- <laughs> so, yeah, so obviously they exist, right? Alexis, Tiffany, Tyler, they exist. There's no arguing that they exist. Um, uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, the closest, I think the thing that makes the most sense to me is these are people that Rose had some passing connection to, right? Um, Alexis mm. went to high school with Rose or something, and it was a kind of a conscious decision to tap into some of these people that have some connection, but warp that connection and make it something else, which is powerful magics. Yeah. Um, maybe. I, I've just actually been working off the assumption they might be fake as well. Yeah, could be. M- could be. Mostly because of Tiffany. Like, like Tiffany's always been this kind of oddball mm. in the group. And, like, you know, especially she's taken all the events that have happened since they all look way less cool than the others. And it might be because the others were all kind of created to be Rose's cabal. And then Tiff Mm. just somehow met up with the fakers after they were created, got roped in. And now she's just this poor, innocent human who's been tracked into like, uh, (laughs) you know, Rose's uh, magically made uh, perfect cabal. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I probably think that Rose senior didn't expect Blake to awaken his friends. <laughs> and so it could be likely that, that there's some really weird shit going on where they were just meant to be vestiges that kind of existed around Blake and he was meant to die around that time anyway. So, you know, well, it w- wouldn't be too much of a worry. Yeah, well, I, I was actually thinking maybe they were designed for ex- explicitly this. Like, otherwise, why have Blake live in a block with a bunch of, like, mm. friends who also don't have many connections to the world outside yeah, of the true, block? Like, they, true. they do seem quite well designed for it so like i i could see it going either way mm. um, yeah okay but i mean wait i think the real big question here is like what the fuck did this cost like this must have cost like this is some big magics mm. um it, yeah like, like you know there's there's a lot of a lot of alteration being done here like this is like many layers of reverse erring mm. uh, going on because like page remembers blake and not rose mm. uh yeah this, yeah. Is, I, I mean, yeah this is so I, big I, like, yeah it is just... it is right um and so i don't know like there's there's a couple of things that might be important like we know fucking rose had barbatorum chained up in the attic um and he seemed to have played some part the lawyers seem to have played some part mm. um so yeah there's but, but you don't you don't get this stuff for free like I no just, you don't uh, i'm wondering i'm wondering what we're gonna we're gonna find out was the price for yeah because, I mean, it even went so far, apparently. Like, Conquest had echoes of Blake back in <laughs> Arc 7, right? Yeah. So, like, was this... Was was history rewritten so effectively that it created echoes? Or, um... I mean, the only other thought is Laird was the one who gave them the Conquest and Laird's in on it. Or mm. was in on it. Mm-hmm. Um, which would fill in some gaps, I guess. Like, if, if Laird was just another pawn that was a self-aware one. I don't know. Like, God, I, I don't know. I... I don't know. That's my summary of where I am right now. Um, <laughs> yeah. Like, wait, did, 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 does Rose know? Did Rose know? Does Rose know? I don't know. Well, I, she I definitely think... knows now, I think. I suspect. Um, uh, maybe. I, I think she did all along, to be honest. Mm. That's my that's my sneaking suspicion. It, it would help explain why she was so willing to lie to Blake um, mm. about the awakening ritual. Um, outside mm. of just being kind of angry at him at the time. Mm. Like... And that, and that, why she felt so bad because she knew she was using him. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah, which like, man, it, like this can't be the way he was meant to sort of go out, like, <laughs> getting getting hit by her because it no, was like I the least so. clean way he could do yep. it. Um, um, the thing I like about this as well is there's there were those conversations back in whatever arc one or two where Blake was pledging that he would help Rose and like, yep, you're a vestige, but like you're real, and I'm going to help you out of this situation. Uh, Imagine if Rose knew, like, I don't know, that mm, feels mm. pretty fucked up to me. Yeah, and, but she was, she was quite upset. She about was that whole weird thing. about those situations. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah. And, and so, I mean, I guess now I want to get into the juicy part, which is like, I want to talk about like Blake and who he is and why it was all mm. presumably crafted to make him good for what he was designed to do. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, like starting on that, like, you know, doing those things, like always offering things to Rose um, like, like wanting to protect her stuff. Like he was always someone who felt this need to 
pay back people and be equal to them. And obviously that meant that he didn't ever try to betray Rose because yeah. he always sort of felt indebted to her. Yeah. And it also, you know, obviously kept the karma in pretty good form. Like, yeah. I think he could have done a lot worse with, uh, with the karma. Yeah. Any heir could uh, <laughs> inherit it, like a Diabolus yeah. uh, library. Uh, one thing about his design that I really that is really fun being recontextualized is we've shut on Blake so much for how self-sacrificing he is. <laughs> like <laughs> the fact that he was always sacrifice himself to, for the people around him in some cases to the detriment of the people around him. Like, <laughs> but this, it makes so much sense. Yes. When you think the whole, his whole point is to be sacrificed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's pretty good. I mean, I'm sorry. I'm just seeing the other thing. Like, you know how his whole thing has always been like, he, thinks of vestiges and ghosts as like more real and important like mm. i wonder if that was you know subconsciously just, <laughs> he's one of them right maybe um, maybe especially because rose always seemed quite callous about that stuff yeah like, it's I, true I, I think we called her out a number of times for being weirdly hypocritical towards things yeah. like vestiges mm, um, interesting turns out it wasn't hypocritical um <laughs> So uh, one of the things I really like is like we've we've always talked about how Blake is so like artistic and and improvisational in his mm. practicing, and it's like very opposite to Rose. And I yeah. think that was probably intentional to kind of show her the sorry to show her the benefits of that sort of approach. Yeah, or or just to kind of shore up the gaps that she has. Yeah, exactly. Like it's just you know, hey, look at this other way. It, it works sometimes. Like mm. you know, find find a healthy middle ground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh- yeah, like they 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 were designed to be the perfect companions to each other, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, um, yeah. Also, you know, obviously he was designed to be the warrior, the yep. the little battler who never gives in. Yeah. Um, which is that's just getting your money's worth, right? Like you just yeah, don't of want course. Him to give up. You just like, don't want him to give up. Yeah. Yeah. And, imagine but- if he <laughs> if he was any reasonable sort of person, he would have been catatonic about twenty four hours in. But the thing um, is, like that actually kind of messed up the plan a bit right yeah, like yeah, I think his inability are. to die yeah i think they op'd that that's that stat <laughs> like uh, they should have turned that down a, a little bit, bit too much yeah no um, next time, i, I mean next another time. thing is <laughs> he was so designed to be traumatized by his memories as well that he like never thought about them like this is something we're talking about in this chapter this is the first time he's been willing to even think about any of this stuff we had yeah. no idea like we didn't know carl's name until last chapter yeah uh or, or the chapter before um anyway so obviously that's you know he he never poked at the holes in his memories because he was too afraid to go back to them yeah um, which i um, thought was like you know it's it's a very interesting and like it's it's a good design like terrible but good <laughs> design. and and you know we've seen him confront his memories maybe like well just once right with the echoes and the mm. one time that that happened he kind of already was a bit poking holes in them like he the memory of getting beaten up by the by whatever the street thugs um, he already was mm. like, oh, this is a bit off. Oh, they must have maybe been goblins instead of humans. Like, it was <laughs> e- even a small chance to confront that. He already was kind of picking a hole in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, then obviously a big thing that's defined Blake is how he trusts his gut. Yeah. Um, over everything. And I mean, that sort of <laughs> makes him, like, I like this because it's like, that makes him inclined to follow his programming. Like, if he's been programmed with this sort of history... And part of that history is he follows his gut. He's going to be less inclined to go against it. So, yeah, presumably it made him more predictable. Obviously not quite predictable enough, but I'm sure it helped. Yeah. Um, I want to touch on one other thing here that has just kind of occurred to me, which is uh, Blake's ability to uh, adapt. Maybe this is diving in a bit too deep, but um, Blake, <laughs> we, we talked about Blake thinking of himself as the kind of person who doesn't have a phone just because he forgot that he had a phone. <laughs> um, but... This is something that's so interesting to me. Like, it, it kind of makes sense now that as a vestige, he would kind of just adapt. It'd be designed to adapt to whatever situation he was put into and be like, yep, that's the situation I'm in. Like, that's my memories. Like, of course, I'll just live according to the memories that I have because that's what defines who I am. Uh, and so, of course, Blake is just not the kind of person who has a phone now because he, he that part of his backstory was forgotten. Yeah, well, it ties into the whole thing about him and glamour, right? Yeah. Uh, like, he... Uh... He's good at faking it. Um, yeah, I mean, and adapting. If He's, if he, if he thinks something is true, or if someone thinks it's true about him, it kind of becomes true because he's a vestige, yeah. not a person. Well, well that, I mean, that's kind of true of everything. Like, that's what I love about Pact is, uh, like what everyone thinks actually does matter a lot for, yeah. for everything. It's yeah. just a great magic system. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, obviously, like you know, homelessness was a great uh sort of 
like plausible backstory as to why he he's he's so capable of living it tough. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know. So that that's sort of that's sort of all the big points for Blake. Like I I, I could think of. Um. And then like I thought as we sort of round out talking about this and nine point four, we should we we'll sort of go back at Blake's past. And anyway, this obviously ties into that. But like uh, I'm interested to sort of try and decipher why he was given the memories that he was given. Like mm. you know, if you're trying to build this person that that we've just talked about that they designed mm. how do these memories contribute to that yep yep um so we already sort of touched on on like the old the old man and the farm yeah like i, I kind of feel like this was making him not trust good things mm. um like you don't get things for free everything costs which is you know yeah pretty cool to the world any- yeah yeah pretty important for a practitioner to know yeah um i thought the the sort of sexuality of the commune was was a particularly interesting one yeah uh, because it like it really adds to our understanding of why he's so averse to like any physical intimacy because it was for such a long part of his life used as a tool of manipulation um yeah like so as well as obviously like the the incident with carl we have like this much more prolonged sort of negative association that he would now have with it yeah definitely um and i think it kind of helps him keep people physically but also emotionally at a distance right which you don't want people to get too close and figure out you know whatever that something doesn't add up about or blake yeah yeah exactly yeah um and with the bit where he leaves with alexis uh because there's a bit where he sort of says you know oh there's always a reason you can't sometimes you've just got to do it Mm. and and um that works for him more or less like that's what gets them out and and has them learn the truth and the police get called and so i think that's sort of you know that that was part of that that's like a memory that sort of shapes his whole trusting his gut thing because yeah he wasn't super convinced it was a cold anymore but he was trusting his gut and he ran and, and alexis came with him so it, it really imprints that trust of alexis i'm i'm convincing myself more and more as we talk about this that alexis was designed um <laughs> as part of this oh that's rough but hey you know that just means that she'll probably expire well, now, okay, now I'm, now I'm depressed. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, no, definitely. I, I think, um, like, the part of the backstory where he was kind of, he, he f- was forced to flee, right? It, it's it's him kind of not being willing to just kind of let things sit. He's he's there mm-hmm. to make shit happen. He's there to stir shit up. He's there to kind of get, get in people's way and, and do things. Yeah. And so now it's so interesting because he's sitting here and, I mean, he's still around. It's like Miss Lewis said, like, this is the least ideal outcome yeah. uh, for the original plan, presumably. Like, this is where Blake's demise has gone from, oh, that wasn't quite how we wanted it to, oh, shit. Yeah. So what, I mean, yeah. So there's two, there's two chapters left in this arc, right? There's no 9.5 hmm. and there's no 9.6. What, I, like, I'm so excited to see Blake's next step, I guess. I mean, like, hmm. what do you do? Now that when you realize that you're a you're a Westworld robot, like what is your next step? I don't know. Well, so it's interesting because before it felt like there were sort of three distinct. Like, we talked about the whole Christmas Carol comparison, the past, present, and future things. Yes, yeah. and and so I wonder if we're still going to be dealing with those. Like to fully get out, are, are they still three distinct things, or was it three manifestations of this one truth? Yeah, that Blake had underpinning him, and. Uh, uh, I, I don't know. I actually, I'm, I, like, I've only just thought about this. So I, I could see it going either way. Mm. Like maybe we've got two more chapters where, one, he has to deal with what this means for his relationship with Rose, because we already talked about her being his sort of present. And then in the future, like, now he's going to have to, like, on, on the back of this revelation, I think he's got to figure out what the fuck this means for what he does now. Yeah. Um, I mean, do you... <laughs> we were talking about... and uh, Okay, so one of the themes that we've touched on throughout this, this uh, chap- arc so far is... Hey, the drains doesn't seem that bad. Like, there's a lot of things about the drains that don't seem actually that bad. Um, I mean, there's a lot to hate, but there's, you know, there's a kind of peace to the yeah. place. Yeah. Uh, so now he's able to kind of make a bit more of an informed choice of like, hey, what allegiance do I actually owe my f- my fake other self? Uh, or, mm. you know, fake from his perspective, I guess. <laughs> and yeah. fake friends. Like, do I? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, I think I think they may have overdesigned his uh, loyalty to his friends. Uh, I have a feeling they're going to be a big driver as to why he still pushes to get out. Um, um, yeah, but we yeah, know like, some so of these I, I connections know. I guess, aren't fake. My guess fake. would be the, the um, rest of this arc is going to have to do with figuring out 
where like you know i think i think we will stick with that present and future i guess and mm. we'll, we'll probably end, presumably end the arc with blake sort of getting out i assume mm. yeah unless he gets double or raised <laughs> yeah, there's, <laughs> imagine there's another layer down <laughs> and he has to get up back to the drains no 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 imagine here's how it goes elliot he gets erased and you think oh no okay blake's gone and then you're like okay wait we, we're following him along but then this arc ends with him dying again and now he's gone forever this arc just gives you a little sliver of hope and then crushes it completely. <laughs> that would be very Blake. Um, no. no, I mean, what, like, the other situation I can see is, like, uh, like Blake in the drains still talks about trying to go and fight Ur. Uh, yeah. I just imagine him getting out of the drains and being like, oh, I got you this time, and just, you know, cut to arc 10 where we open up and he's back in the drains and say, like, oh, fuck, no, no, not <laughs> it again. It turns into Groundhog Day, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Ooh, all right, so, uh, yeah, I guess that's that. I mean, like, I kind of want to reread the whole thing now and pull out all the things, right? Like, Yeah, the- I think, like, a couple of weeks ago I was joking on our Discord that, like, we're going to have to do another podcast going yeah. to Impact, but, like, with the knowledge this time. Yeah, deeper Impact, and, yeah. Yeah, and, like, that's becoming less and less of a joke every time we have one of these shattering twists. Yeah, maybe. I mean, God, can we, are we going to, maybe for the 10 year anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was a joke, guys. Don't, don't hold us to it. Uh, but anyway, th- that's the end of our discussion about Null 9.4. Thank you for joining us. Um, like we mentioned, we have that discussion question about historical figures falling into the drains and coming back out. Uh, and to leave your answer to that in our discussion thread, as well as leave any fun things that you kind of thought up of oh wait this is really recontextualized now based on this 9.4 twist um leave some of that stuff down in the discussion thread which we linked in the episode description thing down below yes uh and of course the other way to get in contact with us is on twitter at media md podcast mm. um and if you want to help out the show uh, we don't usually talk about this but why not give us a review on itunes you know like it's one of the ways that people find the show new people find the show so if you're one of those people that love wild bow works and can't wait to share them with as many people as possible this is a great way to do it review our show on itunes and it'll help new people come and find this podcast and hopefully they'll figure out to start you know half a year ago and not jump in <laughs> from from here <laughs> also uh stitcher does reviews as well as as uh you know matt and scott have recently discovered and let us know so mm. uh hit us up on on stitcher as well yeah definitely um links to do these different things can be found on our website uh doofmedia.com where you can find all that stuff as well as all of the other great doof media shows uh the Doof cast, yeah. uh, we've got Ward, um, and new Doof member, the, the newest member of the Doof family, uh, Do the Right Thing, uh, which is a great writing podcast that a lot of people on the Doof Discord have been getting into. Yeah, uh, it's it's been a lot of fun already. I think uh, uh, when this uh, uh, when this episode's out, we've just passed the deadline uh, for this week's episode, but that means that the words are out for next week. Uh, I think they're actually just released on the Discord as I'm sitting here recording this. All right, so got to get started. Go. When you when this episode comes out, you got like six and a half days to, um, you know, find thirty minutes to to do the right thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, that Doof Discord that you mentioned, Elliot. If people want to find out about that and check out where all these great discussions about all these shows and Wild Bow works, as well as miscellaneous other things are happening, where can they go? Yeah, so if you head on over to patreon.com slash doofmedia, you can become a patron of the network and all those funds go directly to, you know, supporting the shows on the Doof Network. Yep. Uh, you know, all the ones we just mentioned. And, and you know, there's different perks for different amounts you can donate. Uh, and the, the last one is for $1 a month. Uh, the Discord is one of those perks and that's really good value for money. So it's definitely worth checking out. Yeah, um, it's it's definitely worth it if you have the money to support the shows. Um, joining the $1 uh, patron tier will get you access to the Discord and you'll jump on in and everyone will welcome you with uh, with open arms and pictures of snakes, which is a joke that only the <laughs> Discord patrons will get. So uh, if you want to be in on jokes like that one, go, go back us on Patreon. <laughs> uh, yes, and, and of course, Wabo has a Patreon as well patreon.com slash wabo and you got to throw him some money as well if you're enjoying this story as much as we are yeah he'll, he'll write it so that you were a vestige the whole time too mm-hmm. yeah and you, no one wants that um no anyway thanks for joining us for null 9.5 uh we'll be back with null sorry that this was null 9.4 we'll be back with null 9.5 in uh two days on wednesday the 7th so we'll see you then we'll see just how blake reacts to all this mind shattering yeah, like- <laughs> 
I so I don't know if I want to read this chapter or not. I'm so nervous. Well, I don't know what to make of it. You like... gotta you're gonna read it, Elliot, <laughs> and then people can follow along with your read on at Media MD Podcast on Twitter. Yeah, yeah. Come join me nervously venture into this next chapter on Twitter. Anyway, I can I can hear the outro music is playing us off, so we better get out of here. See you guys. See ya.